As Mike mentioned, uh, tonight uh, our lesson is about praise. It's about glorifying God. And uh, we felt that uh, mixing the message and the music together uh, would be perhaps a little more effective, a little more uh, edifying. I'd like to begin by reading Ephesians chapter five, beginning in verse 15. So if you have your Bibles, Ephesians chapter five, verse 15. It says, therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. You know, there's always a certain debate that goes on between different groups who claim to be Christians about you know, who are the true disciples? Who are the ones who are true? Who are the ones that are in error? You know, we're the true guys, you're the false guys. You know, that debate goes on all the time. And I suppose you could make a long list of qualifications to determine who are the legitimate ones, uh, you know, the legitimate disciples from the fakes. But I'm, I'm reassured that, that you know, if you just narrowed these things down, you could probably make a, a very short list to kind of determine the sincere disciple of Christ, who is and who isn't. For example, one of the criteria would be, well, that Christians, the true Christians, are loving people. They're people who express and embody the love of God. And they love each other. You know, Jesus said, this is how all men will know that you are my disciples. Imagine he says it in black and white. You want to know how everybody's going to absolutely know if you're my disciples? He says, in the way you love each other. The way that you love each other will be first and foremost the most a uh, deliberate sign of your discipleship uh, to me. And of course, true Christians love their neighbor, whether their neighbor is Christian or not, not the point. They love their neighbor because loving neighbor is uh, Christ-like. You know, what's interesting, I, I, I have to digress here just slightly, just for a moment, not in my notes or anything. But the terrible tragedy that's taking place uh, in Europe at the moment with thousands and thousands and thousands of people fleeing from the destruction in Muslim countries, you know, Syria and Iraq and, and Afghanistan and all these places where you know, the government is bombing their own people and ISIS and all that business. And these poor people, I mean, you know, I feel badly for them. They're moms and dads with little kids and they've walked for days and weeks just to get away so that they're not killed. And they're wanting to come to Europe and Germany is saying, you know, we'll, we'll take some of these people in and some of the other countries will take some people in. There's a little foot dragging going on, but when I hear the leaders talk, they're saying, well, as Christian countries, you know. And what's really interesting, these hundreds of thousands of Muslims who are escaping the ravages of war in their country, Qatar, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, all these countries, Muslim countries, have agreed to take in zero. Isn't that amazing? These Muslim countries refuse to take a single Muslim refugee. The only countries that will take and help them are Christian countries. Isn't that amazing? To me, that is such an indictment of their hypocrisy. But I digress. This is a time for praise. And it makes sense. Why? Because we said, who are the Christians? Well, they're the ones who love one another and who love their neighbors as themselves. A true mark of the Christian. That's not something that's uh, elemental in other religions. So love is the distinguishing characteristic of those who claim to be Christians. Another one, Christians obey Christ. 
You know, Jesus placed the obeying of his word above the ability to do great things, above the ability to do miracles or works or uh, dynamic religious pomp and ceremony. In Matthew uh, 7, verse uh, 22 and 23, um, hang on, let me get there, 22 and 23, he said, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And what does Jesus say? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And so those who are willing to obey Jesus Christ and specifically his word, this is also a basic attitude of the sincere Christian. And then one more I put in, and, and this will really fit into our, our lesson tonight. True Christians praise God. They praise God. True Christians are those who truly and sincerely praise the Lord. You know, I know that you know, we could go into a long digression here about the use of instruments in public worship or the, you know, the rightness or the wrongness of certain types of worship practices, you know, worship teams and the use of drama and contemporary versus traditional. You know, we get into that whole argument and I don't want to, you know, I want to go there. And of course, these are important issues. They need to be discussed and studied. But the point that I want to make about worship is that true praise is not only true praise because it's done you know, without a musical instrument. There's more to it than just getting the form of praise correct. And so love is the character of the true disciple. Obedience is the attitude of that disciple and praise is the activity that most identifies him or her. People say, how, how, how come you have that evening service? A lot of people, you know, they don't have that evening service. Because we like to praise God. That's why. I know we say, well, you know, some people work at night. But how many people here work at night? You, know? <laughs> you people don't work at night. You're here. Why do we do that? We love to praise God. We love to hear his word. Why do you have it on Wednesday? Well, because we love to praise God. We love to hear his word. And so in the short time remaining, I'd like to focus on praise as a defining mark of God's people. And Mike's going to lead us in a song before we begin talking about those things. So what is praise? Hebrew word, halal. Original word meant in English, making a noise or to boast. The word halal. You look at the um, English dictionary for praise, it said words, songs that tell the worth or the goodness of someone or something. In the Bible, it's an expression of joy uh, using different methods. Using songs, for example, music and dance in the Old Testament times using psalms and poems and scriptures and prayers, all various ways to make that joyful noise. Now, uh, worship expression could be formal, like it can be formal or organized worship, much as what we're doing here tonight. If you look at the Old Testament, the Old Testament had elaborate uh, processions uh, that led to the temple with choirs and music and dancers and a, and a parade. In the New Testament, worship uh, uh, was a different, same spirit, different form. Worship with singing, the singing of hymns and prayers and psalms in the public meeting place. And we know it was formal and organized because Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 14, you know, the specific order on how to do these things. Doesn't make it less worship because we're doing it uh, formally. A lot of people think, you know, if you do formal worship, oh, that's not real worship. The Spirit's not really there. Really? We're calling upon Jesus. We're worshiping in Jesus' name. We're worshiping the true and living God using words from His Word. You're going to tell me that that's not acceptable worship? You know, we mustn't get the, uh, the idea of emotion mixed up in there. God has not asked us for emotion. He's asked us to praise Him. And it's in the giving of praise that stimulates our emotion of joy. So you, know, you can have formal or organized worship, but then there's also spontaneous worship. In the Old Testament, when the Jews crossed the Red Sea 
and their enemies were defeated, there was a spontaneous song of joy sung by Moses and the, uh, and the men in Exodus chapter 15. And Miriam, his sister, and the women, they danced and they sang with joy, verses 20 and 21, spontaneous, spontaneous worship. In the New Testament, we, we uh, read about Mary who rejoices in praise when she visits her cousin Eliz Elizabeth, that beautiful, what they call the Magnificat, you know, in uh, Luke chapter one, verses 46 and forward, a beautiful, beautiful, spontaneous praise, all of it, all of it couched in, in scripture. We call that a doxology, doxology, a, a spontaneous praise. So whether formal or spontaneous, Praise is the action of externalizing what we believe and what we feel about God in song, in prayer, and uh, as well as other actions. So let's think about that as we sing the next song. So what's the motivation? What motivation do we have for praise? Is it just because we have to? Well, the motivation actually begins with God himself. When we discover his wisdom and his power and his love expressed in creation and man's salvation, it produces something in us. It produces awe, we're, we're, we're impressed. It produces joy, a certain happiness. It produces and motivates thanksgiving. We're grateful, right? Someone does something nice for you I don't know, have you been ill or something like that and then all of a sudden, unexpectedly, somebody, you look out the window, whoa, somebody's mowed your lawn and then another brother's come by, a sister brought you some food and uh, you know, rented you a nice movie to watch because you can't get out of the house. You know, how do you feel? Oh, thank you so much. These people are so kind. You know? And these are for just providing some of the simple things in life. Imagine, imagine the awe and joy and thanksgiving expressed and praised when we are motivated by what God has done, not just our brother or sister or kind neighbor. For example, let's consider the sun, right? The sun, the sun up in the sky as a source of motivation to praise. We know the sun is a star, it's the closest one to the earth. And if you look up to the sun and you look from left to right, okay, well, that distance from left to right is 865,400 miles. Almost a million, you know, you're looking at the sun from, from left to right, almost a million miles across. And listen to this, it's one of the smallest stars in the heavens. And there are billions of these. Have you ever thought about that? That's not, we're not guessing, we don't go by faith. The scientists tell us this. They're the ones who have measured it for us. And so the God that we pray to, the God that we ask help from, is the God that created all of these stars. Doesn't that impress you about how great he is? You know, David declared in Psalm 19, one and two, and I was, had to smile, I was sitting there this morning listening to him, to Marty preach, and Marty picks the same, you know, someone said to me, maybe you guys ought to start talking to each other, you know, but I kind of like this system a little better. We can give the glory to God, amen, brother? We can give the glory to God. So, so what does David say? He says, the heavens are telling of the glory of God, and the expanse is declaring the work of his hand. So when I look up to the heavens and I see all the stars and I ask myself, why, why are they up there? The Lord himself tells me through his, Satan, uh, through his servant rather, that they are there to show me how great he is. And I am impressed and I want to say so. Imagine creating all of these. Now there may be some other reasons that he had to create all of these. I don't think we need all these billions and billions of stars just to navigate across the Atlantic or to know what time it is. I think a few stars could have taken care of that business. The Bible tells us that the reason God made all of this was to give us a reason for praise. Imagine what kind of being is this? so grand, so spectacular. I mean, brothers and sisters, 
That's the definition of awesome. That's awesome, okay? Not that my football team won by so many touchdowns. That's great and that's fun, but that's not awesome. So this is just one facet of his creation. Can you imagine if we understood everything that needed to be understood just about the insect world or the world of vegetation? You know, we have this little uh, hummingbird feeder thing uh, outside of our window there, in our sunroom at the house. And we've waited a long time for those little birds to show up, you know, month after month, nothing. You know, we kept, you know, the stuff kept drying up. So finally, two or three of these little hummingbirds have come to feed and, and they're just three feet away from us across from the glass. And I've heard of hummingbirds and seen the hummingbirds and they're cute little things. But when they're three feet away from you and you observe the color, the way they're scaled, the, the flying method, you, know, you wonder how can they even fly like that? How can wings move so quickly and move them up and down and angled and so on and so forth? It's simply Amazing, and that's just one little bird that you can hold in your hand. And, and, and the thing is, that as you begin to see life and begin to recognize life and observe life and observe all these things, you can't help but say, God, you're so great. You're so wonderful. I mean, if I could, I should be praising him 24 seven all the days of my life until I die. That would be the right and proper thing to do based on everything he's done. It's only by his mercy that he allows me a coffee break, a bathroom break, I gotta go to work break, I gotta sleep break, sometimes I gotta have some fun and go play golf break. You know what I'm saying? Only by his mercy. But what I ought to be doing is be prostrate on the ground and worshiping 24 seven because of how great he is, how great he is. And so when considering all of this, we're overwhelmed and it provokes us to be in awe and to compliment the creator concerning his creation. Happily, happily, gifted men and women have written songs and poems that help me you know, who, who is not talented in writing poetry or songs that express awe and joy, someone else has written those songs that I am able to use those songs to express my raw appreciation, my raw wonder, my raw sense of being overwhelmed by how fantastic God is. So what's the motivation for praise. Well, first of all, God himself and what he's done. Another motivation, consider salvation as a source of motivation to praise. Because we're sinners, because we're imperfect, because we're undeserving, we were destined to die physically and then face a judgment of condemnation and then suffer torment uh, eternally. That, that, was our, you know, that was our destiny. Instead, this God who created those stars established an elaborate plan to prepare the world for his own appearance among men as a man in order to save all men from their uh, destiny of, uh, of judgment. He became part of his creation. It's like you becoming a part of a picture that you paint. Imagine you paint a, a scene and, and, and you step into your own painting. Isn't that fantastic? I mean, the best part, however, is why he did it. He did it so that the creation could become like the creator. Why do you think Paul says that Christians exult in hope of the glory of God? Romans 5, 2, exult, they're just overwhelmed with joy. They exult in what? The hope the promise, and, and what is the promise they exult in? The glory of God. What, what is it that I hope for? His glory? He's already got glory, what am I hoping for? I'm hoping for my glory. My glory is the thing that I hope for. I'm going to become even more like Him. 
You know, in our class this morning, you know, you know, understanding your religion, we talked about the end game, this Christianity. What's the end game with Christianity? Well, the end game with Christianity is we die and then we resurrect. How? In this glory. We resurrect equipped with a body that is able to survive in the spiritual realm. Just like we have a physical body that can survive in the physical realm, like we can drink the water and eat the food and breathe the air because we have a body that is equipped for that. Well, what we're going towards as Christians, we're going towards a time when God will resurrect us from the dead and equip us with a body that will survive, that will, uh, that will exist in the spiritual dimension. Purely spiritual dimension. That's one step. That's glory. And then there's another step after that. Then there's the exaltation. And what's the exaltation? Well, that we will be at the right hand of God with Christ. That's the end game. That's where we're going, to be at the right hand of God with Christ, to be folded into the Godhead. Amazing, isn't it? That's where we're going. He's bringing us to be with Him, to share his life, to share his, uh, his being. So there's no way in the world that I, with my own strength, could become like my creator and share his experience. Like the drawing or the painting, it has no power to become alive like the artist. It's a painting, it reflects life, but it is not itself alive. In other words, the painting cannot paint another picture. The painting cannot talk, cannot sing. This is only the artist that can, you know, only the artist can do that. But God, becoming man in Jesus, gave his creation the life that he had, and now the creation is alive, careful, now the creation is alive in the same way that the creator is alive. Man now shares the quality of life experience that God has. And so God is eternal, well man is now eternal. And God knows man, well now man knows God. God is pure and holy, well now man is holy and pure. And God rules supreme. Well one day, man will rule with Christ. This gift of life, I have received, makes me joyful. It's free, it's precious, it's indestructible, and as far as I'm concerned, it's mine. It's mine. Nobody can take it away from me. I want to tell him how wonderful he is. I want to express my joy in thanksgiving. If we didn't have these songs, if we didn't have these psalms, uh, if we didn't have people to instruct us on how to sing and how to praise God, I mean, I think I'd blow up. I'd just blow up. I want to proclaim the wonderful news that once I was not, never mind I was lost, I was not. And now I am and I will always be, and I will always be praising him. You know, one of the French philosophers, René Descartes, um, said the following. He said, I doubt, therefore I think. And I think, therefore I am. And that was pretty kind of deep stuff, right? Well, all Christians can go one step further. Christians can say, I am, therefore I praise. That's where we go. Because of that, we pause here. Having said this much, how can we continue with words when only songs could express the feelings that I've just described? So praising God, it's not something you're just born with. It's learned, not innately given. It's learned, it's developed. So some practical you know, steps to develop, not just how you praise, but the attitude of praise. The experience of spontaneous praise is quite exciting and organized praise in worship can be very edifying if we have an attitude of praise already within our hearts. 
This attitude needs to be cultivated every single day. So that you know, Sundays and Wednesdays, that kind of praise, organized praise, can be a positive experience in one's life, not just a kind of a habit. And of course, we can be surprised by the joy of spontaneous praise overflowing from our hearts and coming out of our mouths uh, each day. And, and that doesn't happen unless you're cultivating the attitude of praise. So for this to happen, each of us needs to do a couple of things. First of all, we need to give God the credit for all good that is in our lives. Eliminate this idea of lucky or fluke or destiny or evolution, you know, get rid of that stuff. Okay? Attribute to God the credit for everything good in life each and every single day. Brother Harold, you know, he, he's tapped into the right idea. He's kind of trained us for years and years to say the Lord has really blessed me, but that's true. When good things happen, the Lord has really blessed me. You know, you, you, if that thing gets ingrained, you're at Harrington's or you're at somewhere and the, you, you order four new tires and the, and the, the lady says, uh, whoa, he said, yeah, boy, you're a lucky man he said, because uh, Uniroyal is just having a sale and you're going to get $100 off on your tire. And if you said that thing enough times in your mind, the thing that comes out of your mouth is, well, the Lord has really blessed me, hasn't he? You'd be amazed on how, how many people kind of stop short and go, uh, yeah, I guess. <laughs> It's a habit. It's a habit. Learn to see God's hand working in all things. There's not enough joy in your life, not enough spiritual happiness. Try seeing God's hand in everything around you. Ask Him to open your eyes. Lord, open my eyes. Let me see you work, Lord. And that'll provoke praise in you and thanksgiving. Number two, Focus your complete mind and will and strength on doing His will. If you work, work for the Lord in what you do. And when you play, remember Him in your leisure. Live in such a way that you are always aware of His presence. You ever, you ever think about the idea that God is always aware of our presence? It is we who are not aware of his constant presence. Now, you know, this is a very suffocating idea at first. When you first become, I don't know about you, when I first became a Christian, the idea that God was always there, he, everything I thought he knew, oh dear, that's terrible. Uh, you know, everything I did, every intention of my heart, everything was laid bare, open to him. I couldn't, you know, like David said, I, if I go deep, you're deep. If I go high, you're high. If I go to another place, you're there. I go in the darkness, you're there. I go in the light, you're, you're everywhere. And at the beginning, that's kind of suffocating. You know, I don't know about you, but I was raised an only child and I liked my quiet time, my alone time. But eventually you get used to it. Eventually, we come to love his ever-present company. We come to love it. The only people who don't like his company are people who are trying to cover their sins. They don't like his company. And so in order to cultivate this attitude of praise, add one other thing, pray Every day, every day. It is in prayer that we express the reverence and joy and assurance that we feel from the works and the presence of God in our lives. The reason that pro athletes, for example, do such amazing things is that they spend most of their time practicing where there's nobody watching except the coach. They get to box for a half hour, they get to run the ball for two hours, they get to you know, hit the puck for two hours, you know what I'm saying? But 200 hours of practice has gone in before they, they step onto the field. We're amazed by that. But we're amazed by them because they have put in the time when nobody is watching. Well, prayer's like that. Nobody's watching you. Here we're watching, but at home, in your quiet moment while you're driving your car, only the Lord is watching. Daily prayer is the spiritual exercise that permits intelligent, thoughtful, spiritual praise in the assembly. I exhort, you know, we, we follow what we believe the New Testament teaches concerning public worship, that the men provide the spiritual leadership 
uh, in the assembly, in the local assembly. That, that means the men serve as the elders. The men lead the congregation in worship. And, and I am always so thankful that the women in our congregation understand this spiritual principle. Uh, and they're in submission to the leadership of the elders, as we all are, but they're also in submission to this idea of male spiritual leadership in the, in the assembly. We've never had a row or an argument over that idea. Well, that's a good thing. However, that only continues to work well if the men are worthy of the leadership that God has given them. You know, when the men get that little card in the mail that says in two weeks from now, you're going to be leading the prayer. It's not just that we don't want you to forget that you're leading the prayer in two weeks. We'd like you to be thinking about that for two weeks. Or in a week or so from now, you're going to be at the Lord's table. You know, Brother Kerry came up this morning, had his piece of paper. He had thought about how to present something that would be edifying to the church. He didn't do that, you know, two minutes before he, he got up here. He got the card. He knew that he was going to lead our thoughts. And so he prepared for that. Daily prayer is what kind of primes us for those moments when we're called upon to pray. And then, of course, outbursts of joyful, spontaneous praise are only possible if we're people of prayer, people who are constantly in communication with God. So love, obedience to Christ, and praise, these are the marks that, that identify God's people on earth because they are the marks of those who are already in heaven with God. That's what the people in God, uh, uh, that's what the people in heaven with God do. Brothers and sisters, at this very moment, heaven is filled with holy beings who are totally absorbed in praising God constantly. We read about that in Revelation chapter five. So here's my invitation, one of the invitations. I'm going to extend another one in a moment here. Let us join the heavenly hosts at this moment in praising God, and I think uh, we have a slide up there, there we go. Let us all read together as we praise God in words, as the local assembly stands, if you wish, sorry, and reads together and joins with the heavenly chorus words of praise. Praise, praise the Lord. Lord, praise, praise God, God in his sanctuary, praise, praise him in his mighty expanse. expanse. Praise Him for His mighty deeds. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Amen. One last little point I want to make. God only receives praise from obedient believers. All these people out there in the world, you know, praying to statues and their ancestors and gold images and all that kind of stuff. Pilgrims who gather by the millions to go to a place where there's a rock and they kind of, you know, walk around the rock. God only receives praise from obedient believers. So make sure that your prayers and your praise are being heard in heaven because the Bible says God does not hear the prayer of sinners. John chapter 9 verse 31. So when we preach the gospel and we say there's only one name under heaven by which you can be saved, Acts chapter 4 verse 12, we mean there's only one name that you can be saved by. And in saying that, we're also saying there's only one name through whom you can pray that your prayers will, will go to God. Oh, God is aware of what's going on, but he does not hear the prayers of, of sinners. So if you're a sinner and you haven't obeyed the gospel, you can yell and shout all you want. God's not hearing your prayers. The only way that you will have your prayers heard is if you obey Jesus Christ, repent of your sins, be baptized in his name, call on God in prayer because he will 
He will hear you. And God may not even be hearing your prayers as a Christian sometimes because, because you may have sinned in the sense that you may have continued in sin and refused to give up sin and refused to reveal and shine the light on your secret sin, whatever that is. Maybe it's time to, uh, maybe time to shed some light on that dark part of your life and if you need to do that, this is a good time to do that. The Spirit is here, the church is here, our elders are here. Everyone that can help you, truly help you in this type of need is present at the time. And so if you need to respond to the invitation which I have just made in all seriousness, then I encourage you to do so as Mike leads us once again in the song of invitation. Let's stand for that once again, please.